increasing organic matter is vital. Like you, you can, you know, the crops suffer really hard in a, in a low organic matter, a brittle environment like this, you know, you're getting 60, 80 mile an hour wind some days. It'll, it'll move all that soil along. You need to have a lot of insulation, like a lot of microbial activity, a lot of mycelium in the soil. You, you want it to like to be bound together, you know, and you like, I, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's just different constitutions to compost, um, uh, cover cropping, especially if you're just kicking off and, or you're transitioning and putting in a healthy cover crop, uh, is, is it would, like in our altitude, we found a couple of cover crop recipes and we're working on it on a, on a winter kind of like post frost because we catch such an early frost. Let's say we catch it September 15th. It, it, historically, I could only sow a cover crop late August to get it in. Um, and and now I'm working on, you know, stuff that germinates at 40 degrees, like the triticale, uh, winter rye, mustard green kind of daikon mix. Um, there's one from True Value. They have an organic mix uh, that that's like a winter hardy mix. And I sowed it after potatoes, uh, which was probably September 22nd of 2022 came up and was established about three inches, sat under four plus feet of snow the entire winter. And is it is totally established. It's probably about eight and a half inches now. And we haven't had a day above 60 um, in very few nights that are frost free. And I've seen a substantial amount of growth on it. I am super excited. Today we have Zach from Frema Farm and I am so excited because everybody says you can only do regenerative farming where it rains and I am here to have Zach just blow that theory out of the water. So, <laughs> Zach, tell me a little bit about your amazing operation, how you started and where it is today. All right. Uh, so we are a two acre uh, CCOF certified, real organic project certified um old style truck stop market garden uh in in the high desert we're uh, we're located at 5260 feet in the eastern sierras um our annual precipitation up here is about seven inches of annual precipitation a year um and we started this will be our eighth season up here um we we actually had a really, I, I worked at the Great Basin Food Co-op, which is the, the largest food co-op that's close to us for four years. And I helped develop the food system. And we realized, and, and even starting there, I knew that there were huge gaps in what the consumer's demand was and what the producers were producing. And we, like most places, have a lot of old-time farmers that have been multi-generationally um, farming or ranching up here in the high altitudes. And they touch what they or they grow what they grow and they don't touch the other stuff and so i recognized that um about two years into my my venture at the great basin food co-op i was running the kitchen the produce department and the juice bar but all things produce related and uh yeah i, I we started a we started a a, a small farm then and we, we we planted about a quarter acre the first year uh put a bunch of agribon over it, put drip tape down and then, and forgot about it, came back out months later. It's not, I mean, not quite like that, but it felt like that. Okay. Um, and we had cabbage and kale that was just huge. And it was kind of taking over. It was a dormant alfalfa field before that. So it had a ton of nitrogen in it and uh, a lot of organic matter, tons of weeds, you know, it was just absolutely wild, but um, it produced a ton, uh, like, I mean, uh, lots and lots and lots of food. And I, I guess I acknowledged it personally at that point as the first occupation and life passion that I had had that I, it was giving more to me than I, I could give to it. And it was a really unique concept in my mind because like I could come out and I would work 10 hour days in the city and I'd come out and I would spend four to six hours outdoors, hula hoeing, you know, harvesting, just getting through all the stuff. And the days that I would do that and I'd spend that time outside, I'd actually feel better then the days that I would just do like a 10 hour desk job at the co-op or, you know, running around and helping stock the produce shelves or whatever it was that I had to do that day. 
And it became so blatantly obvious that I, I, I just, I couldn't not go all in. And so I spent two more years uh, at the Great Basin Food Co-op. And then I, yeah, I, I departed there at the end of a, a farming season in August of 2015, I believe it was, or 20, yeah, 2015. And then we started full-time uh, up here at Prema. And um, yeah, now we we employ uh, usually three to four full-time employees with two to three interns. Um, we don't, we haven't used grant funding or anything for the education outlets and stuff that we do, but we, you know, we waited for, for year six. And so we felt like we had a lot of secure SOPs, a ton of crop loss and failure. Um, there aren't really a whole lot of crop varieties that, that do well in such a volatile environment. We had diurnal shifts of about 50 degrees uh, some days. So we'll hit a 90 degree day with 40 degree nights, 80 degree days with 30 degree nights, fairly common. And you're telling um, and, me delicate yeah. vegetables don't like that? Why? Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's like, it did. Honestly, I, we probably had 30% crop loss the first year when we started to really diversify. And we were growing probably 25% or 25 different varieties of crops that season mm -hmm. and lost 30% of them. Um, and it's heartbreaking. And, you know, that kind of work. Uh, yeah, it's just you, you're putting your whole life up out there and like I'm feeding a family and I'm doing all of that. And yeah, so I, I, I but I really desperately wanted to learn and decided that I would stick with it. And even after, you know, like lots of trials and tribulations, uh, the first three seasons, yeah, I decided I mean, it was it was still abundantly clear to me that it was it, it's like my life's purpose or what I should be doing in the world. Like it continues to to make me feel you know, on 70, 80 hour weeks, like I'm doing the right thing and that I, I feel healthy. I feel vibrant. I feel connected. Yeah. I it's think a, we have to, right? Like farming is so hard. You have to be all in on that passion or that's a, a very short lived job. You're not going to make it to that year 10 or anything. <laughs> no, I, we see that, right. You see yeah. the turnover that comes in people that are like inspired and, you know, kind of like conceptually just like about regenerative back and maybe they're feeling they're like, they're, they're, or they're getting an idea of where they belong in that because, yeah. You know, it's not just about farming or ranching. You know, there's many dimensions in education and, and all of that that exists around this. And I think that it's helpful that people come and do immersions, like calling it an apprenticeship. But I ended up taking on, or not apprenticeship, like all internships, but I ended up taking on apprentices. Like yeah. I was looking for people that were just like right about ready to go out, start a farm, tap right in, had land access, or were trying to find the land. Um, and yeah, I just had like the resilience and the ability to, to kind of see this through. And I was calling it an internship, but it was far from that. Like it was, there was a wholehearted expedition where, you know, every time something broke, I would have four people there right next to me explaining every part of the process. Like, nope. yeah. And it, it it's, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't look back on that or I still don't. I think that it was like a, a hard, a hardship of the farm because now we've helped bring in, uh, I don't know, six or seven other farms in the last three seasons uh, that are similar conceptually to ours, kind of like hand scale, uh, regenerative uh, focused farms, which is which is cool for the, you know, for the food system, especially in a space that's like an absolute food desert otherwise. Yeah. So give me a little like scale on what you're doing. Like you're feeding a lot of people on two acres. Kind of where are you right now? <laughs> yeah, well, we do an 80 person CSA and we've done as many as 120 person CSA. Um, we have 1.75 acres approximately in production each season. Um, we cover crop 30% of that. And uh, the CSA for 80 people usually equates to about 15% of our gross annual sales. Um, we always, since year two, we, we've grossed um, more than six figures per acre. Um, and and now we do on 1.75 uh we're roughly about 250 to 280 thousand dollars in gross annual sales off 1.75 acres and so it's a it, it's a highly productive you know like an average person our average family spends 400 dollars a week and we'll have you know twenty thousand dollar weeks in peak season and so we could feed 500 families um you know, off of that, but that, you know, that's, it's always like hard to equate and scale, but the, yeah. I would say, yeah, I'd say probably more accurately, you know, maybe a thousand people a week will feed uh, off the farm beginning in, in early June. And then, and then pushing that all the way to the end of October, our, our, our frosts are, are June 15th to about September 15th. So we have a 90 day frost free window 
which is which is i mean right the crazy throw, which is like, bananas <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's altitude that does that it makes it really volatile but like yeah. today you know we usually start planting carrots and we cover them with agribon or rime out mid-march but this year there was five feet of snow in mid-march on the on the farm still and so we yeah we we, we actually prepped and planted out the first two zones just this week. It was it was twenty or nineteen degrees two nights ago. Last night it was twenty two, and then tonight we're centered on thirty degrees. And then the first the next ten days look like they're they're hovering in the thirty. So we're putting onions and kale and, and parsley out in two whole zones uh, today, which is which feels great to do. We finally got through that, but the prop house has been like overflowing. We've got we've got transplants like and walkways in the greenhouses and stuff. So. But it's not abnormal. Like we've got to be honest I know, with you. I know that's like, just mind blowing to me. Like we're like, oh, it's like seventy during the day and forty at night, and that feels drastic. And you're like, no, no, hold your hats. Like <laughs> yeah, it we're gets worse. Freezing and like we we're so hot we could die. <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's and it's it, we've gotten used to it. And so yeah, it's like it's a really trying environment. My dad asked me. He's like, you know, you could have done anything because I I did fairly well in school and. Like I, I've had a pretty centered, like head on my shoulders my whole life. And he's like, you could have gone to law school. You could have been a lawyer. Like you could have, you know, just done anything you wanted to do. What is wrong but he's with like, you? <laughs> yeah. He's like, I'm not surprised that you elected to do like the hardest occupation yeah. or one of the hardest occupations on earth in the hardest place on earth. He's like, that's just like, it's just indicative of your personality. So, well, I think a lot of people are so lucky that you did because we found you because we found other mm -hmm. people that we were like, wow, this is an amazing farmer in a brutal environment. And we asked, can we interview you? And they said, no, no, go to Zach. There's no point in talking to us. Like you should just go to Zach. So not only have you like done amazing things for your two acres, like you've inspired so many other people. So can you just share a little mm -hmm. bit about like that teaching model and like, kind of what that would be like for other people who maybe haven't started down that road. They're passionate, they're excited, but they've been like, maybe had a few bumps with interns or not quite attracted yeah. the right people. Do you have any words of wisdom in that area? Yeah, I, I think speaking to like the farmers, ranchers uh, and, and that community, we it, it, it became like year five for me, it became really tr like I knew that I had to start documenting all of the stuff because it was all in my head. And I knew like, cool, uh, there's a lot of things that happen by sight, by feel, by touch, by taste, by smell. Like I'm, I'm imbibing that through the senses and that, that, that aren't translatable. But there's probably 70 to 80 percent of the information on the farm that is that okay. is translatable. And so it, it gave me a like I, I was unsatisfied with a lot of the employees that were coming out working through the farm. And then after it happened for a couple of seasons, it, it became really obvious to me that it's not them. It's me. Like it's my inability to translate what I'm looking for, the way that I'd like to see it, like the bunch sizes, like all the SOPs and the things that I could translate on paper, but I had never taken the time to do because I was too damn busy to do it. But it became very, very clear to me that if I was to take the time to do that and to translate it, to write a handbook, to write SOPs, to write an intern manual, I mean, I'm probably, you know, three quarters of my way through a book between the, the employee manual and the intern handbook. Yeah. But with doing that, it transitioned the entire farm. And yeah. now there's expectations everywhere. Like I have checklists and, and people sign off on checklists and the things that I felt like were too redundant. But to think of what it would be like somebody's like an intern's experience stepping into an absolutely almost chaotic environment where there's all, you know, 40 different varieties of crops being harvested every week. You know, there's all these expectations that are imposed on me. And then I'm supposed to learn that. And, you know, whatever this two or three week processing time before things get really busy, you know, from April till May. Yeah. And the, it, like I could see it in their experience. And what they really needed was just stability. They needed to feel like their actions were they were where they were supposed to be and that they were doing the right task while they were doing that task and that they had some confirmation of that. And like as a, such a small operation, I'm not going to be able to do that every day with somebody and be like, hey, you did awesome today. I'm, I really appreciate the way you harvested the salad mix. You got a thousand bunches of carrots. Unbelievable. That's not going to happen. But what, what, what I found was that if I could translate these expectations and then give people confirmations that they were doing a right job every day, that, you know, if I interacted with them in that way once or twice a week, that it was sufficient. And then I, I was just using a paper trail, like as simple as a task ticket for every employee every day where they would 
I'd write Dow harvest carrots with, you know, Cassidy and I combine two task tickets and say, okay, cool. I need uh, 180 bunches and you guys have three hours to harvest this. And then they would, they'd wipe it out in two hours, you know, and they would feel really good about it. They'd start getting ahead on their task tickets. Mm-hmm. They'd start getting all these like cues that they're like above and beyond and they're doing well. And it was motivating for them. And it absolved me from having to be some like disciplinarian and like kind of lost in those the, the, like places that I didn't want to be on the farm either. And so like real clear communication, uh, having expectations and knowing like what I needed off each bed and each harvest per bed, per bed foot, like as far as metrics for that go. Um, and, I, you know, John Martin Forte talked about this years ago in the market garden when he wrote that. And he's like, he, he built, he kind of built his business from the expectation of what my gross annual sales needed to be. So he looked at like his, his labor and all of his fixed costs his anticipated budget for the year. And, and and then he's like, cool, like I know that I need to make $220,000. I have 110 beds on the farm. So every bed needs to be $2,000. And how do we achieve that? And so if you have a really clear expectation and then and then you know that you can translate that, then you know the price per bunch that you have or the price per pound or price per everything as it gets to market. And so you can translate that cost. You could also begin to communicate that with all of your staff and say, hey, like, this is the worth of that vegetable, as opposed to like, looking at your comp, your price comp list from, you know, monocrop farms that are producing 1000s of acres of something that may have a a price that's completely irrelevant to what you're trying to produce it for. And there's flavor in that, right? Like, I mean, there's there's a lot of, I think, now science coming out that's that's confirming like why these little bio uh, a biologically active regenerative farms are producing flavorful foods that are also more nutritious and like, and all of these things and people having confirmations in their mouth. So they feel good about paying you a little bit more, but if you're looking at price comps from somebody else and like, ma- you know, like major companies and wholesale, it's, it's never going to match up to your bottom line. And so anyway, we, we, yeah, we go from kind of a similar concept where I know what I need to make off every bed. I can translate that to the customer. I can give that to the employee I feel really clear on it. I know when things are achieving and they're not achieving uh, and, and we can make good decisions and sound decisions around that because I have metrics. And so, yeah, like the whole farm is revolving like a business, you know, and as a business should. And, 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 you know, I, I, I just, I, I guess I keep things tight. I, I, I hold everybody accountable. Everybody knows what their expectations are. It allows things to, to run really fluid and to, to thrive. And so, yeah, the staff feel good being here. I feel good about the job they're doing. And it becomes really, really clear when somebody's having an off day or somebody's having an off week and somebody's not really into doing what they're supposed to be doing. And you can confront that immediately just by watching the way that they're operating on the farm. And that becomes, you know, just data driven. And so it's not like some emotional interaction where you're like, hey, you know, like, I don't feel like you're doing a good job. It's like, you're harvesting 50% of what everybody else is on the farm. This is an issue. Uh, let's talk about it. Do you, do you still want to be here? Is this a place that you're comfortable in being? Are you having a hard time doing the physical portions of this? And yeah. would you like to see yourself maybe in a different way? And I, cause I could have, I like, you could just push somebody to the wash and pack. And we had, we had one guy that just had some lower back problems. He loved, loved being out here. And he would put house music on in the, pro, in the, in the, in the wash and pack every day and he just loved to wash carrots pack everything and that was his job while everybody else was like thriving out in the field but it took that conversation and just saying like hey like i noticed that you're not you're not thriving out there is there like a better place that you see yourself on the farm do you want to take off and not be here anymore just it allows for things to be really open transparent and uh, yeah allow me to feel like i'm thriving them to feel like they're thriving and, and, you know, like it, it, yeah, it, it, and it equates to a, a good bottom line as far as a business goes to, which is, which is a really kind of wholesome environment. I feel like there was like 15 really important business lessons <laughs> in there. Like, I wish Sorry. I could like pull each of them out for an hour because there's a clear expectations of workers. It's not, you know, I'm the farmer and I want things done this way. And if you don't understand that, like you have these very clear communications it's set like a business, it's got metrics so people can achieve or underachieve. And it's not personal, it's not a a constraint. And I love that you talk about treating it as a business, because a lot of us come into farming, and we're so excited, we're so enthusiastic, we work all the time, and we try to make wholesale numbers, and we don't pay ourselves. Well, we know that business doesn't work out at the end of the day, you know, that's a, that's a short road to burnout and being very unhappy anyway. 
So yeah. with you being able to keep those top line numbers, you've got metrics to go, you know what the bed costs. If you have a hit, you get it and you know, and you know how to catch back up or pull back. Like, so let's about to say hi. Business background, I could nerd out exactly about how you take all those concepts and drill it down, but just very, very insightful. Um, I'll take us in a more hands-on direction. Let's talk about, mm -hmm. I am so new. I want a market garden in the desert, but I don't really get that rain doesn't happen. Tell me kind of your advice for people who are in brittle environments, they're passionate, or maybe somebody who does market gardens, but they've never done it regeneratively. Kind of what are some of your big concepts that you take them down? Yeah, moisture retention, um, increasing organic matter is vital. Like you, you can't, you know, the crops suffer really hard in a, in a low organic matter, a brittle environment like this. You know, you're getting 60, 80 mile an hour wind some days. It'll, it'll move all that soil along. You need to have a lot of insulation, like a lot of microbial activity, a lot of mycelium in the soil. You, you, you want it to like to be bound together, you know, and you like, I, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's just different constitutions to compost, um, uh, cover cropping, especially if you're just kicking off and, or you're transitioning and putting in a healthy cover crop, uh, is, is it would, like in our altitude, we found a couple of cover crop recipes and we're working on it on a, on a winter kind of like post frost because we catch such an early frost. Let's say we catch it September 15th. It, it, historically, I could only sow a cover crop late August to get it in. Um, and and now I'm working on, you know, stuff that germinates at 40 degrees, like the triticale, uh, winter rye, mustard green kind of daikon mix. Um, there's one from True Value. They have an organic mix uh, that that's like a winter hardy mix. And I sowed it after potatoes, uh, which was probably September 22nd of 2022 came up and was established about three inches, sat under four plus feet of snow the entire winter. And is it is totally established. It's probably about eight and a half inches now. And we haven't had a day above 60 um, in very few nights that are frost free. And I've seen a substantial amount of growth on it. Um, cool. So we cover crop. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. That's crazy. So <laughs> it is. No, it's, it, it is unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. But I used to say like, yeah, my I, I just can't hit those windows. Like it's really hard for me. So I would rely super heavy on compost. And and like, I, that means about a yard compost for every bed, um, a, a dozen wheelbarrows uh, per hundred foot bed. And, and so it's, it's just a lot, a lot of input, a lot of compost down in the greenhouses. That's twice a season. All the outdoor beds would get that amount of compost every single season. And I'm sorry, and that's I, a chunk I, financially of the compost would be a huge financial burden where you are. Oh, Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. And that's, that, that's, uh, that's another kind of segue, but a good conversation, but you know, as a startup farm, that may be a financial hardship as a business owner that's established, let's say you've got something that's already going. It's, it's just, you know, for me, I run a cost benefit analysis on that. And I see like, I have no aphids. Um, if I've got a half, I like doing like a half manure, half veg compost, something that's really microbial active. I got a lot of access to super good um, a horse manure, a composted horse manure, an ancient composted horse manure uh, from where the, they have like a wild horse ranch out in Palomino Valley that's relatively close to us. And uh, so I have, I have access to a really cheap form of, of, of super high mineral, well-balanced composted manure. So I work that in with a, uh, a green waste manure and just 50-50 split it. And I, I put $12,000 into compost a year and that's maybe 5% of gross annual, but I, yeah, I, I have no issue putting that in because I see, I have absolutely no aphids. I see a 20% increase in productivity. You know, it's, it's just a no brainer to me because that's like, that, that's the decision that I can make that, that are going to allow my kids to continue to farm on this land if that's what they choose to do, because I'm keeping my organic matter at like six and a half percent. The microbials are, are way up. It's just totally biologically active. The flavor of the food is like, super sweet and it's resilient and i notice it you know and so you th those are the things that you see with your eyes um that are that are yeah i just i feel really important decisions to make um as a business owner but as you start up yeah that might be that might be a little bit difficult to, to pull a trigger on a ten thousand dollar expense you know or a hundred dollars or you know ever forty dollars a bed if you're looking at it like that yeah so i i don't know i i think Focusing on getting your organic matter up, and if you want to do it in a cheap way, and you're not reliant on the production of the field quite yet, and you're just beginning, then go out April, May, 
cover crop it to death you know like like just get it totally saturated and cover crop and then yeah get that beefed up go out and then if you have to you know i'm a no-till guy but i do that because of efficiencies and i i've i've met a lot of guys like phil foster from pinnacle foster out in california and some of like the biggest model farmers that are around and at least like in my region full belly farms is another one and you know those guys are not no-till they run small acreage on no-till and they run some experimentation with that but to like to, to to get a no-till or to get a system that big, you know, where you're putting in direct seeded crops in a, in a terminated no-till cover crop is impossible to get good germination or get that early heat on in the beds. Um, especially, you know, you're not going to be able to put the amount of compost on a, on a, uh, in a system like that, that I'm able to put down in such a small space. And so, yeah, running a light till like an appropriate time, you know, just shallow tillage to work in that cover crop so that you could direct seed if that's your your process. Um, and, and that might be maximally efficient as well if you're a solo person just heading out and, and getting five acres going and you've got a ton of cover crop out there and you've terminated it or whatever you've done, like, but you need to get that that down and decompose so that, you know, the micro, it'll feed the microbial community, the earth the shot, the compost it, and it's going to, you know, work up so that you're getting those those points on your organic matter up which equates to nitrogen, you know, every season. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, it just depends on, on your scale. And I'm not like 100% for just doing it one way. Right. I, yeah, All yeah, in holistic have, context, right? <laughs> it, yeah, you have to just see that, like, if you're steering it in, it, it's about, like, what's in your heart, right? It's about, like, what your overall mission is with the whole thing. Like, if you're, if you're just trying to get everything you can out of the land and you're not looking at as, 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 as like a big living organism that is like, you know, thriving and you are part of that, like you are an expression of it and connected to it vitally. And like when that's dead, yeah. you are dead. Like if you're not going to exist, if that doesn't exist, <laughs> if you don't, if you don't appreciate that and you're not connected to it in a good way, then it's just going to fall apart. But if you are connected to it, then you're going to treat it the way that it needs to be treated and make decisions that are really sound. Um, yeah, and, 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 and its preservation and its longevity and a desire just to, to keep it thriving for, for generations to come. I also feel like it's kind of putting it in the bank, right? Like, so we think about like, you're in a place where just weather is abnormal all the time and that's what you deal with. But, you know, for people who operate more of a stable environment, like if something goes wrong, we kind of have built up that reservoir. We're not like at the bottom where there's just no organic matter and we're kind of running by the skin of our teeth. Like we've at least kind of, built up a reserve that if things go wildly wrong, everything is a little bit more predisposed to be okay to get through it. So I feel like it's also that, right? Like just building yeah. in a safety layer <laughs> at the end of the totally. day. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I mean, who knows what happens tomorrow, you know, like you just do the best you can with everything you can today. and make. You're going to have like five feet of snow the next day and be like, yeah, okay, that's fine. Like, <laughs> we'll just keep going. No. I mean, it, you know, it, it, it burned off it, it, that night, two nights ago when it turned to 20, it snowed six inches and I thought, just give us a little bit. Like we just need an inch, but it did make me happy that I, that I had held back and not planted everything outdoors. Cause I was really under the impression that like I was holding on too long, but yeah, yeah seeing all that snow come down in those cold nights, I, it made, it gave me a better resolve for sure. I love that. Uh, so take me back a little bit more. So cover cropping, really diverse party mix that can grow in snow. Never heard of such a thing, but we'll, we'll drop some links to things you recommend in the comments. <laughs> um, Anything else besides the the really amazing mix? What are some of the other like crazy environment tips of the trade? Anything else you got? Yeah, so wind, I mentioned, you know, we'll see a uh, hundred plus mile an hour winds up here. Um, they come off the the, 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 the the caps of the Eastern Sierras and then blow right down into the valley. And there's nothing that really sits in front of it to stop it or to hold it back. And so infrastructure for us and doing things right the first time is vital and that's uh not an easy lesson for somebody that's just starting up that doesn't have a lot of capital but you know, prioritizing the purchases on the farm and then and then making making sure that you invest wisely is is um uh, is absolutely imminent at least in my situation um it's such a brittle environment where things flux like i i went and pulled down some old weed growers greenhouse in Sacramento because he posted on Facebook because his neighbor got busted the day before. And he was like, I got some, I, somebody needs to come and take this down now. I, he posted, I was on it about 15 minutes later, I drove over across the pass three hours, one way. I had an impact driver, a battery charger and a, and, a, and some tools on me. And I tore down his greenhouse by myself and loaded it up on a, on a F-250 
put a roof rack, tied it down, and then and then got back to my 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 house probably about one thirty the next morning. But I had a prop house, you know, like I just didn't have money to get started. And I came and I put together this this prop house that had had no right to live where it was about. To live. It was, you know, it was, it was like, on its deathbed, and you it, walk it across oh, to yeah, another this thing was <laughs> zone ten, you know, like zone nine, yeah. and I was putting it up in zone four. By the grace of the the spirit of Long Valley, that thing <laughs> decided to stay with me for two seasons, but it had zero ventilation. I, you know, like it was on those big windstorms. I, I felt like I, I, I was inside there seating and doing all the things. And I, I would just think, please, like, let me live another day. Like, I'm not ready to die in this thing. <laughs> it, and it was so oh. close so many times. I feel like just to, to, to losing it and, and to flying away. And I did that you know, because I had to do it. And I was really fortunate it lasted as long as it did. And I, you know, I put a perimeter fence around the farm that, that it cost me kind of $2,500. And I, I secured a bunch of old used T posts that were 12 foot and I got them in three feet. And then I put up a, a plastic deer fence that lasted for about seven months and the deer just jumped right over it, you know, right. like started to debilitate. And th there's lots of other examples where like I impulsively got after some things that were just like there to hold off. But I, I would have been better off just just getting after like one prop house and not doing the fence the first year and prioritizing the investments that were going to give me the greatest return. And then and then and working incrementally from there, as opposed to trying to just like swallow up the whole thing at once and get everything going. And, and because I did that, I had to work backwards and I ended up, you know, like tearing down that prop house. It took a considerable amount of time. I tore down the entire fence line and redid it all, which took a considerable amount of time. And I, you know, I kept shooting myself in the foot until I realized like, yeah, I, I'd be better off seeking out maybe an investor or securing just like holding on to what I can accomplish and taking just whatever little capital I had each season, and then reinvesting that and prioritizing the reinvestments instead of being really spread thin. I, I learned a lot really quickly because I got after it the way I got after it. But if I was to look back, I would I would certainly prioritize just what was going to give me the highest return on my investment. Um, prioritize putting up, you know, maybe a couple of greenhouses uh, that were really nice, well put together. I was going to ask you, what would your list be? Would it be greenhouse? What would your kind of... If in you my, could in go our back. Climate, yeah. Oh, so, yeah, because if, like anybody else around that's in such a harsh climate, it, you know, there's not a whole lot of people that are going to be growing food in in the wintertime. And so if you can get food going and transplanting it, you know, like get your successions going in July, April or July, August, September and transplanting, you know, no later than late September. So that, that way that food is ready November, December, January, when, you know, when you're below 10 hours of sunlight and things aren't moving, and it, or maybe in some places there is no sunlight, you can, you can continue to harvest, you know, the, the, and especially the right varietals. Uh, we use a greenhouse manufacturer from Iowa called Nolts Midwest Photo Supplies, and that's N-O-L-T apostrophe S. They are incredible. Uh, like, you know, they, they, they have the best prices on all the products. They will help with everything. They do not have a wonderful step-by-step uh, -step guide for greenhouse installation. And I we actually just decided to, to record the last greenhouse we built for them. And we're in the process of manufacturing that so that that way when people buy the greenhouse and are in a similar situation to where we started, they'll, they'll be able to get that kind of going. But I would prioritize the things that are going to give me the biggest return and then like using multi-use houses. And so instead of like having a propagation house, a wash and pack, and then a, a 3,000 square foot house, I would just have built two, 3,000 square foot houses. And then I would have multi-purpose the front quarter of maybe the both of the 3,000 square foot houses. One is a wash and pack. And then one is a propagation house that I could erect and then break down when I didn't need so much coverage for it. And so multi-use structures, uh, when you're tight on a budget, are super helpful because, yeah, you could use all the insulative quality that a greenhouse can provide, uh, all the warmth. And, and if you're pumping propane into it or natural gas or whatever, um it just makes it super cost effective and then yeah when you when you start to pull away from that you don't need another space to like hold your harvest or you know keep keep things processed or start all your seed having access to water uh, so you're not hauling hoses around uh you know just taking the time to borrow a trencher or an excavator from your neighbors plumbing things in and, and getting to know things in that way is is really essential at least in my experience i I didn't have money to hire out a contractor to run propane and electrical. And uh, I hopefully nobody from 
Sierra County administration ever listens to this, but if they did, I'm sorry. And I, <laughs> I beg your forgiveness, but I did a lot of it uh, myself and that saved me tens of thousands of dollars, you know, and I had a good guy and I had a, you know, a professional electrician that was a buddy of mine that would come help me finish projects, but he would, he would allow to guide me from point A to point B to let me know, you know, like what aug wire I needed to pull for, you know, for a greenhouse. And like, I had a friend that, you know, worked at Ewing plumbing supply in the city. And I'd go ask him and say like, Hey, I've got the 75 gallon per minute pump. I've got X amount of greenhouses. I've got this drip tape on the beds. Can I run them all at the same time? Like what, yeah, what, what should I do? And people that, that are thinking in that world all the time, it's not a big deal. You know, like he's just, they came right off the top of their heads just to be like, oh, use this aug wire, use this inch pipe. Um, and and so I, I built the farm with the help of others like that. And and that, that helped me save tens of thousands of dollars. But it, it yeah, I think like at the core of that is a vigor or a desire that is, you know, within some of us and that it's not within other of us and recognizing that is a, is, is an essential component. Um, like whether you're, you know, you're, you're ready to take on something that's like, and I'm not trying to discourage people because we need more folks out there growing food, but you just need to recognize like if it's where you're at, whether you're at you know, a place you're going to hire folks out to come in and help out with this stuff or whether you're ready to do this yourself and, and then equip yourself accordingly, you know, go back to the city and, and work for a couple more years and, and know that you need, you know, a hundred grand bottom line to, to get things started. Or, you know, like if you want to just rough it, like I did, like have some decent credit and some zero interest credit cards and then, and then see what, see what the world's going to provide you, you know, max them all out and then yeah, transfer the balance. <laughs> go yeah well i mean i'm so glad it worked out for you because another thing that i see people excited come in and do is that they start doing all that stuff themselves maybe they didn't have the friend that was the plumber and the electrician and they say well i'm gonna go on youtube and i'm gonna figure it out we started down that road we made some very expensive mistakes just being idiots that thought we could learn plumbing on the internet so you know i, I would always uh implore people that if you don't have the resources to hire at, at least go to the experts, right? Like, you know, cool. or make a friend like <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. Or you're digging up the yard and you're hitting a transformer oh. because you didn't call the dig number or whatever, you know? <laughs> oh yeah. Don't yeah. <laughs> don't yeah. Do yeah. If I pay somebody to consult, you know, like have somebody come out and pay them, you know, a hundred bucks an hour, 75 bucks an hour and spend three hours with yeah. them. Yeah. They just don't want to dig, right? Like they'll give you all the consulting and stuff. Oh, That's they not what they dig. Yeah. <laughs> they just don't yeah. want to dig stuff. <laughs> world yeah. yeah yeah and there's a lot of folks a lot of people that are in like traditional trades too i feel like they've come from families that that, that are crafty and like that's been my experience anyways a lot of the plumbers electricians you know they're 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 people that really appreciate farming and regenerative farming at that and so yeah you, they see what you're doing and they like i've had gosh i don't know we had most of the most of the power he a guy had from an excess job and i traded him in vegetables and it took me like four years to pay him back but he was up for it you know and he's like no let's do it like this like i want to i want to keep that going for you guys he like, might have gotten the that? better deal anyway because he's got all this nutritious yeah. food for four years plus inflation like he oh, might have made out better <laughs> i think you're right yeah i think you're totally right now i love that all right so we've hit a bucket load of snow we've hit weather temps that just go up and down and we've hit wind do you have any other crazy environmental things that you're working against for on fire yeah yeah we so is yeah. there an element that you're not working against like you know of the <laughs> hurricanes the hurricanes. hurricanes there you go <laughs> yeah yeah we had a tornado touchdown uh for the first time but it was like about four years ago and it was actually a fire tornado and it made national news yeah it, it was That's a the safe fire, thing <laughs> the fire the fire cloud came so big that it that it created uh like this big cumulus cloud and it, it actually self-perpetuated into a, a fire tornado which was yeah i mean i guess it made world news or national news but it, it, friends of mine sent it to me from cnn and i was like wow it's really unbelievable but yeah we um we had a forty thousand acre burn in uh 2020 uh, we had a million acre burn uh, six miles north of us in 2021, and then 2022 was a was a better year. Like we, yeah, it, it, it's just been it's been nonstop, and and this year will probably be pretty bad. We've got a, about 250 percent of our, our our annual rainfall totals already, but the grasses will 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 come up and go dry, especially if it cuts off the way that it usually does in summertime. We just have a rain season and then a dry season here. And so we're going to see a substantial growth of grass. And then we're going to see um, just a tremendous 
amount of um of tinder up on the the mountain sides and the hill sides around us and so the one lightning storm and then those brush fires move super fast it's 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 cool though i mean it those brush fires do go fast but when the trees are saturated in water the trees don't burn and the brush fires just move underneath the brush and kind of like how they they would end in a really natural kind of ecosystem and so it's not too devastating but i i i assume that we'll see a lot of fires and and how how we work with fires here um I ran a two inch pipe, a soft pipe, just irrigation, not buried, uh, about 60 miles or 60, 60 feet in the direction from which all of the, the, the winds blow, which is a, we have a predominantly Southwest wind here. Uh, and then I teed it off on a one inch and then ran a 400 foot stretch of one inch that covers the largest, like the, the, well, from the road where they would have a an, an advantage to attack in the fire uh, all the way down to the the far northern tip of the farm, it, it covers all of that. And there's um, there's micro emitters on that to drench. Uh, and I can't remember the GPMs on it, but uh, yeah, they're 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 placed like every 15 feet, which is their emitter spacing. And yeah, the the plan with that is is that we would just crank it and then leave it on as the fires approach. They've been really diligent we're not populated back where we are so if the fire was simultaneously coming out of more populated area then we the resources would get pulled for the populace and we would burn back here um yeah i, I don't know I, we have a skid steer uh bucket track that we use for turning compost it's a high horsepower one it's a it's a 90 horsepower one so i could cut trenches with it into the hillside pretty well and then we've we got uh, the neighbors around us have some big big old cats too and so there's some advantage to it for sure. Um, we yeah kind of turn into your own fire department and fire resilience. And we actually just got, I think our, our fire insurance quadrupled this year. So I dumped it and, uh, and yeah, so we're self-insuring to, to, to not have that coverage just because the, yeah, it's, it's, it's now become irrationally expensive for us to keep it. And I, I feel better about just holding on to that money each season instead of allowing, yeah, some insurance broker or company to, to make money on it from us. And so, I figure we'll fight it ourselves. Yeah, well, and especially if you have all that forefront that you kind of not, you know, you're not a firefighter. This is not what you were born to do, but that you have figured out, like, these are the steps that we can take within reasonable about to prepare ourselves. You know, sometimes there's just things we can't fix, you know, and then there's definitely things we can fix. So, and I, I think there's a farming community aspect, right? That you have neighbors that everybody would be willing to like bond together. And that if yeah. there is an extreme, you kind of know who's on your team. So I always am like, know your neighbors, <laughs> know, <Better. laughs> make yeah. friends, bring all those muffins. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. Keep things friendly. Yeah, get together for breakfast once a month or twice, you know, twice a quarter if you can. Like, yeah, spend, spend good time together, feed each other. It's important. Yeah. And before you ever buy a property, get to know your neighbors, right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Any attention? yeah. It's just, yeah, you never, you never know what you're tapping into. And so it's important. All right. So, fire, wind, rain, everything else that comes at you. Any other good tips for people who are getting started in this space? I feel like anybody who is farming like in zone seven down is like a cakewalk compared to what you're doing, but. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, tips? well, you could, uh, yeah, an attitude of gratitude is pretty helpful after talking to me. You could realize that somebody's got it worse than you do and they're they're doing okay. And so I know, I was about to say, like we just we're in we're in Virginia and it rains all the time. And every time you make a mistake, it rains and it fixes itself. Like so <laughs> I feel like people should go through like a, a starter course. If you're gonna regeneratively farm, you start in the nice spot and then you work your way up to where you are and like that's more or less <laughs> hell, right? <laughs> Totally. Totally. I do. I, I think a lot of it is just attitude, like in how we approach all of the stuff. And yeah, like it depends on our resilience and yeah, like our, our disposition and then perspective on the world, you know, I guess. Yeah. Just it's, it's, and then that'll determine how we digest every experience and see it as failure or opportunity. And, and yeah, see it as an opportunity of personal growth. And, you know, like there's going to be a lot of things that break you down and make you cry and you could really appreciate that or you could, decide that that you just don't want to go any further into that and yeah the 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 worst environment you know the worse it's going to be but the greater the opportunity is as well you know so we we have a, a, a i mean just a, a beautiful market we have such an established market and clientele and people love us and everything that we grow sells and you know like it's it's really magical because you feel like you're doing such good things and, and people fill you up with all sorts of compliments and maybe that's because not a whole lot, a, a whole lot of other people are doing 
what we're doing. And so, yeah, it just, it provides a really ripe space for opportunity. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, 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 I think like this is a, it's a solution to so many things. Um, and it's a, it's a homecoming, you know, for like us individually as well. A reminder of like, who we are, like what we're doing on this planet, um, where we've come from uh, and, and a step back in a lot of like uh, of, of our more, most current mechanized wisdom in many circumstances to, to grow food in, in hand scale or even regenerative ways, you know, like, um, and so there's, there's a lot of remembering that happens. And I think like in that process, we have a sense of fulfillment that, that keeps us going and, and, and allows us to feel like we're part of something that's great and beautiful and wonderful and that we're doing, um, we're doing big work and we, you know, we are where we're supposed to be. And you, 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 you just can't ask for anything greater from, you know, like an individual life than, than feeling like you're in the right place at the right time and doing, you know, like and it, with just confirmations of hummingbirds and ladybugs and, and earthworms, you know, and all the songbirds and like all the folks that come to visit the farm and hang out with you because it's, you know, like, and that includes black widows and rattlesnakes and all the people that want to come and, you know, just like join in on your party because, you develop something that reminds them maybe of, of, of the way that things used to be and like yeah, just a thriving ecosystem. And so, yeah, it just makes you feel good. It makes you feel like, yeah, you're doing your, your life's work. And, and, and I think just from that by itself, that is really inspiring and it touches a lot of people's lives and, you know, people, people, yeah, they become happier because you're happy and, you make a, a great impact on the world for doing what you're supposed to be doing. Well, and I think that kind of is a testament to your business in general too, because not only have you created a like farm ecosystem, you've created an ecosystem of community with those customers, with people you train and so on. Is there any way like that you have found to communicate that value? Because we can say inside me, I am a regenerative farmer. I get it. Like I have that feeling mm. that get go. Sometimes that's so hard to like put into words, like, you know, the first time you told your dad you're going to go farm in the desert after, you know, all the, the education and everything. Dad, I'm going to go hang out in the desert and try to grow carrots. How do you find a good way to communicate those things to people that get them inspired? Because you've clearly done it. Like people are drawn to what you're doing. How do you, how do you perpetuate that? Yeah, I, I think this is kind of just a natural extension of what we were just saying. Like, I, I feel like it, it happens very naturally because if somebody like is doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing in the world and people are, are they let they they gravitate towards that because they want to know more they want to feel more they want to be part of it they are like it feels magical for some reason and like you know you, you feel like you're very inspired and so that that, that like i the, one of the worst things you could do is like aspire to be in a place of of inspiring others i feel like that in itself is a contradiction because you contract and that contracted space doesn't allow you to stay open and inspiring. So, but what I do see is that like finding alignment with something that's much bigger than me, like mother nature and the whole process of mother nature, uh, it kind of, you know, like it happens through you in a sense, like you, you start doing right action by the ways of mother earth. And like, she starts to party with you and celebrate with you. And then it becomes like you're just, you know, like you're just another extension. You're just like a sunflower out there, like with the rest of the sunflowers that you get to vibe with the rest of the world. And I, I don't want to get too like esoteric in saying this, but <laughs> that, uh, it just, it, it, I, I, that's, it's, it's, it's an experience that I have all the time. And so, yeah, I, I feel like you have to meet people where they're at. And so it's not, it's not helpful to get woo woo on folks, especially if they're like totally cerebral and, you know, but they, they, most of the time people will digest the fact that you're happy and established where you're at and they'll let, they'll, they'll gravitate towards that. And even if that's just in the form of like a transaction of business, but the cool thing is, is that there's confirmations that happen from that is that you know, when people associate that transaction to flavor, they transaction, they, they, like they see that the salad mix that they got from you lasts for five weeks in their fridge and they're like, how is this possible? You know? <laughs> yeah. And there's all these confirmations that happen because because yeah they had like a really good transaction with you i i find that that leads to longevity and like that leads to return customers that leads to um people desiring to come and work with you that leads to yeah just like a lot of the things that people are hoping for and ironically that comes back from you know just taking care of the soil 
And, and so, yeah, you just become an extension of that, an intermediary, intermediary, you know, like at the market space for that or whatever. And, and then, yeah, we, we've seen just a tremendous impact on the community and the people that desire to continue to come back and celebrate that with us week over week, year over year. Yeah. They, you know, some people bite on the stuff that we share as far as, you know, like the new science that comes out saying that the antioxidant levels are greater, the you know, microbes create more bricks in the food. So it deters aphids and some of the cool stuff that's happening scientifically. And some people bite because they're like, this is just the best carrot that I've ever eaten in my entire <laughs> lifetime. I don't know why that's happening and why that always happens with your carrots. But like, I'm going to buy your carrots the rest of my life because I can't find anything else like it. And that, yeah, that also goes over to cherry tomatoes and parsley and cilantro. And then people like, they they go further into that spectrum and the barometer then shifts because then you go back to buying, you know, something, you know, just from a regular conventional farm at your normal supermarket and the tomatoes are dead, you know, grown in some <laughs> faraway place, harvested really green. And, you know, like they have no, no light vitality or their flavor or even moisture to them. And so that's yeah, just, it's just part of the process. I feel like it's, it, it starts fundamentally with the soil. And then, then from the soil, it kind of grows outward and it becomes like, um, yeah, just a chain effect that, that, that all aspects of everything get touched um, by doing things the right way in alignment with the way that na nature intended. That's a tough marketing spot, right? Because a lot of us are coming from we taste the difference. And we feel, we feel. What would you kind of say your high level takeaways from your customers are? Because they don't get to do all that with you. They come in and say that the carrot tastes better or the lettuce doesn't wilt sooner. Would there be like a list of things that like if I was brand new to marketing a market garden and I knew that they were there, what are your tangibles that you see in your customers? You mean like flavor wise, like what are the ones that are most substantial for people's feedback? Well, kind of like it, the shelf life of a vegetable and the taste of a vegetable. Are there any other like high level big wins that are specifically a regenerative market garden? Because sometimes it's just so hard to put that tangibility. Like, well, we fixed the yeah. ecosystem and the birds saying, well, customers are like, I don't really care if the birds saying I care if you know, but it's going in my mouth. So <laughs> totally. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think subtly there's there's some information that's coming out, like as far as I think her name's Christine Malone was doing a lot of research for antioxidant levels and bioflavonoids and and that kind of stuff. And so there's confirmations there. But I I, um, I get like feedback directly from from the from farm staff and from people on farm. And when we process uh is seeing like the, the bright, bright colors uh, of the stuff that we're harvesting, um, the ability of it to sustain a lot of diversity as far as weather fluctuations uh, without bolting, uh, like a ton of resilience. Um, and then it deters all of the bugs. And so we see we run a relatively aphid free operation when things are pumping, you know, and like there's no there's no reason for sprays. There's no reason for even contemplating that stuff, no fungicides. Like you and and yeah, you see plants like photosynthesizing at a rate that's remarkable. Like they turn these dark shades of green, and like they have so much vitality in them um, that's absent in 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 other systems. And so, yeah. Um, beyond that, like tangible factors, yeah, we see preservation and cut flowers. You know, like because there's there's just maybe more. In the no-till system, maybe there's more water uptake, uh, more nutrient uptake and more nutrient and water preservation post-harvest uh, that allows those things to sit in people's vases or vases or three, four weeks, you know, and sometimes they're like, this is crazy. Like, these flowers are still living at home. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So I think like other than the abstract, the real like tangible stuff is probably that. There, there was something else in there that I was trying to think of, but uh, yeah, I just, I, I can't, I can't, I can't remember, but maybe it'll come back. Yeah. Well, I think uh, uh, at a primal level, we have this attraction to things that are good for us, right? So maybe they're feeling those vibrant colors, the food connection when they taste it, like maybe there's something primal that's kicking in. And I feel like if we can cultivate that experience, it's not hard to get returns. It's just cultivating that first like exposure and that first willingness to not be in the moment, but try something, understanding that it's going to be different. Sometimes that's a little hard conversion, but. <laughs> totally. But yeah, if you get somebody sold on a carrot, you know, like on the easy sells, like they'll be buying kohlrabi from you after a year or two, you know, because they're like, yeah. I've been this thing for two years. Like I've got to give it a go. Yeah. And yeah, so you do. I think that's how you get more transactions is that people like the, it's not one dimension. It's not just the carrots are better. It's like 
the cherry tomatoes are better, the cilantro is better, the parsley is better, the kales are better. And it's like all the things. And so as people go through it, they, they, their allegiance becomes stronger and they, you know, then they, they're, they're at some point people break and ask that question, well, why is this happening? And I'm open to having those conversations, you know, like my, uh, my partner, she is this just like insanely brilliant powerhouse of a woman and she does all sorts of wonderful stuff but she is really good at communicating like our ethos and trans and like translating that over so when people look at the website or they're like when we're, we do the csa or people buy or pre we, we have like an online store that we pre-sell items for, for people that come to the farmer's market yeah. and she puts the flyers in there that tell this week's story and it's just like a love story about the farm that that you know that kind of weaves the abstract with the tangible physical stuff so it kind of meets everybody right where they're at but it helps people develop the stories and we have customers that have like a collection of our weekly flyers that go in all of these boxes you know and so yeah translating that story is a thing and i've seen people put their flyers like up on their actual farmers market booths that tell a story about the farm tell the story about the individual tell the story about their practices you know, and you might get 25% take on that, but that's pretty big. If somebody's like transforming or willing to transform their belief system, and then they could, they could draw that to an individual purchase. That isn't just like, I mean, somebody, an example, it's like me trying to not do education because I don't feel like there's enough room for the, for more organic farmers in our community. And so like, I'm going to siphon that off instead of realizing that like, no, this is like um, a holistic event that's going to transform the world and that everybody needs that in their life. And it's something that we're all searching for. Mm -hmm. And and so it's better to have more sprouts carrying organic food and more co-ops out there and more whole foods and all of that that are allowing people to transform at their own pace and ask those questions and have these really potent realizations because they're meeting the people right where they're at. And that might mean blueberries it might mean strawberries it might mean cherry tomatoes but as we get these regenerative kind of third-party labeling systems out there for these soil-based products and people and consumers are more aware of that we're going to develop an international allegiance i think that is going to it will transform the industry again just like usda organic did before the that label was compromised so heavily (laughs) i was about to say i feel like we're on the cusp of the organic and i'm just very hopeful it doesn't quite go the way like hopefully we can hold on to our ethos of regenerative agriculture before that gets greenwashed to death <laughs> well, I, you know and we see that right with the farmers uh, that are doing uh, no-till regenerative right and they're putting as much, much glyphosate down in their no-till regenerative systems as as they were before yeah. and so there's 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 not yeah like we need to really be aware yeah who it is that's growing our food and then watching this labeling especially the ones that have no like trademark associated to it or no like legal implications because they're going to run rampant. And I I think, you know, as well as I know that regenerative and like there was a point where sustainability was growing so fast that if it continued on its current growth rate, it was going to replace every single word in the English dictionary by like 2040. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And we're going to see the same thing with regenerative because, you know, like we get these hot words uh, that just take over the industry and then everybody gets infatuated with it. So yeah, it's important that we, that we really translate that, yeah, like the value of all of this stuff before big money and big corporations do that for us. And then we're having to backtrack and, and, and redo that work. Yeah. And I think something that's really tough about that space too is it, learning it is hard and we're going to run into bumps. And there's that very easy say, well, I'll just spray a little here or I'll just do that here. And I, I hope that, you know, particularly people in market gardens, whoever, go ask people like you that are doing it right and saying, how do I overcome this bump instead of succumbing to it's too hard. There are solutions and people out there know they're they're just few and far between and we got to get in there. So I will say everybody in market garden space, definitely call Zach, give him, you know, shoot him an email and go to primafarms.com and Uh sure you guys will help out. But yeah, I just, I don't want this, this whole movement to kind of be eroded by it being too hard or being greenwashed by other entities and just helping people get over those humps. You got to help. Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) I I do. The constant beautiful helper. She, but yeah, I I think, um, yeah, as long as we're talking about it, as long as you're aware of it. And then, and then that's where it all starts, you know, because then people are aware of it. Consumers are aware of it and we'll have our defenses up. I think like once people realize to the extent that USDA um, organics has been compromised, I think I think that that will be a, a big transition for a lot of the 
the the L Legion population out there that's really just seeking better food. Yep. And more opportunities for small scale farmers doing it right. So let's do it. Yeah, hundred yep. percent. I love it. All right, Zach, so much good information. Thank you for all you do in the sleet, rainstorm, and fire tornadoes. Normal things that people say. <laughs> <laughs> You're so sweet. Yeah, I appreciate you. I appreciate you too. It's been really nice uh, just getting to talk to you and wonderful questions. So I appreciate you asking them. Well, thank you so much for all you do. We'll drop links to all your social media and all these things. And I highly recommend everybody go follow the amazing work you're doing. Aw, all right. Well, you take care, Lauren. Thank, Thanks, thank you, Zach. Again.